trustees, and to everyone who made this possible. Congratulations to my fellow honorands. It is a thrill to share this stage with you. Congratulations to every parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, sibling, and loved one. Every member of the faculty and staff gathered here today to cheer on the class of 2022 this morning. What we have been through as a nation, as a planet, and as a species. I am in awe of the graduating class of 2022 and of the entire generation that is now entering the world. Give yourselves a hand, class of 2022, for making it to this day. <laughs> You arrived on this campus as freshmen in the before times, in the fall of 2018. Little, of, little could any of us have known what was to come. You were sent home in the spring of, of 2020, your sophomore year, as the campus and the world shut down due to COVID. The fall of your junior year, 2020, you returned to Mayflower Hill with ever-present masks and testing protocols. You and Colby made national news as a model of how to manage an in-person class environment on a college campus in the midst of a global pandemic. I imagine every one of you would agree with your classmate, Isabella Valdez, a physics major who is off to study for her PhD in astronomy, when she told the Colby News Service that, quote, I wish the times we live in had not quite overlapped with my college experience. <laughs> I feel that so much. Yet you set about your work despite the turmoil beyond Mayflower Hill. I read every single profi senior profile that was sent to me, and I am amazed at your accomplishments. Some of you have already started companies. Kalia Bennett, an African American studies and anthropology major, yes started her own hair braiding business while at Colby. And Christian Krogh, an economics and music major, started a campus food delivery service direct to student dorms. Erica Chung, Erica Chung, a psychology major, worked as a rescuer with Colby Emergency Re Response and played the violin in the symphony orchestra. And Courtney Note Naughton, created a theatrical production for their senior capstone project, drawing on behavioral science and ornithology. Now they're preparing to do seabird research in the Farallon Islands. I love this. <laughs> Colby and the class of 2022 represent the triumph of a liberal arts education over the tyranny of a closed mind. And so today, And so today is a time of both celebration and reflection. We are here. We have made it to this moment. We alive today have somehow survived when six million people across the planet, one million in our own country, have perished from the plague of COVID. We grieve their loss as we seek to make meaning out of tragedy, to act boldly and with courage in honor of the fallen. We are having to ask, why are we here? How did we get to this moment? What are we called upon to do with the reprieve that is life itself? How is it that we've survived a pandemic, political upheaval, ongoing climate change, and the ongoing ruptures of human division? What is our purpose going forward? What have we learned, not just in the classroom or on campus, but as a species in this era of discontent? And what are we to do with what we have learned? with the gift of survival when so many others have succumbed. It feels as if we are crawling out of a dystopian film set and hopefully into the light. We are like survivors of a storm who are called upon to go into the basement to see what the rains have wrought. When you live in an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a storm. <laughs> Choose not to look, however, at your own peril. The owner of an old house knows that whatever you are ignoring will never go away. Whatever is lurking will fester whether you choose to look or not. Ignorance is no protection from the consequences of inaction. Our country is an old house. Wind, flood, and human distemper batter a structure that is already fighting whatever flaws were left unattended in the original foundation. Many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. 
My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built in the foundation. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect these une uneven pillars and joists and beams. We did not install the frayed wiring and corroded pipes, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is, in fact, on our hands. Like other old houses, America has an unseen infrastructure, a caste system that is essential to its operation as the studs and the joists that we cannot see in the physical buildings that we call home. It is the architecture of human hierarchy, the subconscious code of instructions for maintaining, in our case, a 400-year-old social order. Caste is essentially an artificial, arbitrary, graded ranking of human value in a society. It's what determines one's standing, respect, benefit of the doubt, access to resources, or the denial of access to resources, assumptions of competence, worthiness, intelligence, whether one will be protected by the authorities or attacked by the authorities. Caste is the infrastructure of our divisions. Caste is not a word that's often applied to the United States, but it was, the do it was Dr. Martin Luther King who came to the realization of the applicability of this ancient concept when he made a historic trip to India in the winter of 1959. He'd always wanted to get to India because he'd been so inspired by the nonviolent protest philosophy of Mohandas K. Gandhi, and he finally got the chance to go in 1959. Once he got there, it turned out that people were wanting his autograph, they wanted to have a picture taken with him, because on the other side of the planet, people were keenly aware and watching and, and following the liberation movement of African Americans in this country. At one point, Dr. King decided he wanted to visit with people who were then known as untouchables. These are the people who, the group that is assigned to the very bottom of the Indian caste system, and he wanted to visit with them. So he made a trip to the southern part of the country, and he visited a school that was populated by students who were, who were from the untouchable community, now known as Dalits. When, the, when he arrived, the principal was so excited to greet him that he brought the students out, and he said to the students, young people, I wish to introduce you to a fellow untouchable from the United States of America. When Dr. King heard that language applied to him, he first bristled at it. He was, in fact, quite peeved to be seen, to be described in that way. He did not see himself in the language of untouchability. He did not see himself as being at the very bottom of a hierarchy in that way. But then he thought about it. He thought about what was, at that moment, 20 million black people uh, in the United States who, at that very moment, were being excluded from the body politic, excluded from the ability to vote, excluded as to entire spheres of occupations, excluded as to where they could live, where they could go to school. And he thought about it, and he said to himself, I am an untouchable, and every black person in the United States is an untouchable, too. Dr. King came to the realization uh, about this ancient concept because those who knew best what a caste system was, those who were assigned to the very bottom of the caste system in India, instantly recognized caste when they saw it, instantly recognized who fit where in our society, and connected their system of hierarchy to our own. Any number of arbitrary metrics could be used to rank people in a caste system, ethnicity, religion, language. In our country, the, the metric that the colonists chose to use to decide who would be slave or free, who would have rights or no rights, not even over their own bodies, who, who would profit from the labor extracted from others, or who could be reduced, reduced to a commodity, who could be bought, who could be sold, who could be won in a bet, who could be given away as a wedding present, was the metric that we have now come to see as race, a relatively new concept in, the, in human history. That means that the colonists, what they did was they took otherwise neutral characteristics that should have no meaning other than the beautiful range of human manifestation, and they converted that into a value before there was even a United States of America. They assigned people to an inherited role in a hierarchy before there was a United States, and thus slavery became the foundation of a hierarchy built on greed and exploitation was succeeded by Jim Crow, manifest to the current day. 
Here we are having to come to terms with the consequences of this history of hierarchy and caste. We are having to come to terms with the fact that the United States, the richest nation in the world, the most technologically advanced nation in the world, leads the world in the grimmest of distinctions. And that is that the American death toll from COVID-19 has reached one million, meaning that more people have died from COVID-19 in our country, in the United States, than in any other nation on the, in the, on the earth. And when it comes to COVID cases, the United States also leads the world with more than 80 million cases. That's many, many millions more than the second ranked country, which would be India. How is it that two very, very different countries, uh, the oldest democracy, ours, and the largest democracy, India, are being stricken with these numbers? One country has the world's oldest caste system, the other has a less recognized one. A caste system, what it does and what its goal is through social controls and pillars, embeds and foments division. It programs people into believing that they have no stake in the well-being of those that they have been told are uh, beneath them, those that they have been told are unworthy, undeserving. It makes for a less magnanimous society, a built-in us versus them distance between groups. Here we are having to come to terms with the unfathomable erosion of the basic rights of major groups in our country. We are witnessing threats to a half century of protections of women's fundamental freedom over their bodies. We are approaching a time in which women will, could face imprisonment for the most private and painful decision any woman might ever have to make. We, are, we have witnessed terror attacks on Jews in Pittsburgh, Latinos in El Paso, Asian American women in, in Atlanta, LGBTQ people in Orlando, and just last week, African Americans yet again, this time in Buffalo, New York. We alive today are tasked with having to find a way to explain to succeeding generations how is it that we in our time, two years ago this coming week, could see something that most human beings who've ever lived will never see unless they're on the battlefield or in an emergency room. And that is to see a human being killed before our very eyes, George Floyd, nine minutes and 29 seconds. No one to help him, no one to save him, his life drained from him, his humanity stripped from him, and over what? over the presumption that he had supposedly attempted to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. This was an infraction that we learned at the trial of his assailant was not even an arrestable offense. It was an infraction that warranted a citation and a court date, which means that George Floyd should be alive today. We, alive today, we the survivors, are tasked with having to find a way to explain to succeeding generations how is it that a mob of insurrectionists could break into the citadel of democracy itself. How in, the, how in our era, on January 6, 2021, we could see a Confederate flag inside the United States Capitol. We have got to find a way, or are tasked with having to find a way, or burdened with having to find a way to explain to succeeding generations how is it that a rioter in 2021 could deliver the Confederate flag farther than Robert E. Lee himself. Our era calls for a sober and clear-eyed assessment of what we are facing as a nation. As it stands, the United States is facing a crisis of identity unlike any before. The country is headed toward an inversion of its demographics with its powerful uh, ma uh, historic majority expected to be outnumbered by people not of European descent within the next two decades. This is unknown territory for anyone in the hierarchy uh, because this is a configuration that none of us have ever faced. As we have all witnessed, anticipatory fear has already surfaced. It is a danger to the species. It is a danger to the planet to have this depth of unexamined grievance and discontent in the most powerful nation in the world. This will be a test of the cherished ideal of majority rule, the moral and legal framework for America since its founding. Will the United States adhere to its belief in majority rule if the majority does not look as it has throughout history? This will be the chance for America either to further entrench its inequalities or to choose to lead the world as the innovative nation that we have perceived ourselves to be. We have already suffered as a country more than we needed to or that anyone should have expected to. If we have learned anything from COVID, it's that an invisible organism without a brain has managed to cause upheaval across the planet and overtake a smarter species because it does not care about color. It does not care about nationality. It does not care about immigrant status or gender or sexual orientation or national borders or passports. COVID sees all humans, human beings for what we actually are, 
one interconnected and interdependent species. COVID sees all humans as fundamentally the same. It will infect anyone that it has access to long enough. It sees what, sees what we have in, have in common if humans don't see it themselves. We are all in this together. It's time we started acting like it. Your education does not end today. This is only the beginning. It is our responsibility, each of us, as the survivors of our current upheavals, to commit ourselves to repair this old house, heal from our inherited wounds, to run toward history, not away from it, and to learn from history as the instruction manual that it could be if we could only open our eyes to it. I want to conclude with the words of possibly the smartest man who ever lived, Albert Einstein. He escaped Nazi Germany only to become deeply, deeply grieved by the racial inequities he saw in his adopted country, our country. He used his privilege to stand up against injustice, to speak out at every turn. He joined the NAACP. He advocated on behalf of marginalized people, particularly African Americans, with whom he made common cause. I was so moved by his words that I chose them as the epigraph for my book cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Einstein said, quote, if the majority knew of the root of this evil, then the road to its cure would not be long. It will be up to all of us, but particularly the prime beneficiaries of our country's 400-year-old social order to make this a fairer, safer, and more equitable nation for all of us. And I know, class of 2022, that we are closer to this goal and our future is brighter now that you are entering the world. God bless you as you begin this new chapter of your life. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you.